Good morning. It is so good to see you here. It means a lot. As was implied by the prayer and the petitions that have no doubt been on your hearts as well, there is a lot of evil in the world. And our lesson today, sad to say, is based around an event that took place that would not have taken place if it were only righteousness that dwelt upon this land. But I'm very happy and eager to share a message with you, and I hope that the uh, wireless mic is working like it should. Does that sound good to you? Okay, if it sounds good to you, then I'm ready to get started. I am looking forward to the blessing of the lesson that will come uh, as we discuss some topics today that seems a little different. You look on the outline, there's no blanks. Michael never uses an outline without a blank to fill in, and especially that first little letter to get, let me guess what he's going to say. Well, in this case, it's a little different. I knew when we began this series that it would be a little different towards the end because it's there in the scriptures. We can't ignore it, so we're going to have to focus on it in a unique way. So I hope that it's a blessing to you. There are a lot of events that take place, and in the process of our study today, kind of implied by a strange scripture reading, uh, we're going to now make a reference to Luke chapter 7. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have your Bibles tangible or digital, then be sure to bring them next week. We have a particular uh, beginning of a special uh, two-Sunday uh, special uh, theme that you'll definitely need your Bibles for. Today, I wanted to read uh, Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 24 through verse 28. John was a special man indeed. Let's notice this passage. Jesus is testifying of him, and he says, The messengers of John, when they left and had departed, he began to speak to them, to the multitude, concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously, uh, he says, uh, apparelled and live in luxury, are in king's courts. No, 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 but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I say to you, much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Interesting. For this I say, in verse 28, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow, a special man indeed, and how much more blessed are we who can see the things that John did not get to see in his lifetime. He prepared the way for Christ. John is the one who was able to, because of what he did, initiate all of these events. We've been looking at just how special this man is, and the videos are online so that you can catch up if, uh, if you missed those. But we've been studying about a very special man, a very special prophet, who's described best by the word unique. Unique in the sense that he was an evangelist like none other. But we've all learned lessons as we've looked at the man and his mission. He wanted more, most, more than anything in the world. His only desire was to please God and humbly, with integrity, he pointed people to Jesus. And his mission was to prepare the way for Christ. Centered on the message, repent. The message that he came to preach and to get people's hearts ready to repent is to turn to change. And, that, and it implies that you're going the wrong way. There's something wrong with your heart. He told this to the Jews who for centuries had told the Gentiles, repent and turn and be baptized for this reason or that reason. But now he's telling even the Jews, everyone, get right in your heart. You're arrogant. You're selfish. You're full of sin. And in the process, he says, show this decision to receive God's will in everyday living by a baptism. Now, baptism was commonly practiced for different purposes at that time. But particularly, the message attached to this is what not only was from God, but made it also unique. Today, repentance is a vital part. And baptism has all the more significance as we understand now by faith we contact that blood which was shed on the cross by that God-ordained faith response seen throughout every conversion case in the beginning of Acts and every conversion from the beginning of the establishment of the, of the church. So, reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection, contacting the blood at our only atoning sacrifice. It is only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse a single sin, but it is the blood of Christ that can cleanse all sin. So instead of a baptism just by repentance, how much more is it to say a baptism for forgiveness once and for all? In the scriptures, we're going to look at Mark chapter 6. This time, the text is printed for you in your outline for easy referencing. But again, next week, be sure to bring your Bibles uh, if you don't have a, a habit of doing so. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 17 through 29, we're going to discuss the dance of Salome, 
the desire of Herodias's hateful spirit, and the death, yes, the death of John the baptizer at about the age that I am right now. By the time you get to Mark chapter 6, John is already dead. But the reason we're going to this text is because it gives a flashback. In the chronology of time of this gospel, it gives a flashback into the events surrounding his death. The only place in the Bible that lists those sordid, frightening details. And so we're going to have to focus on this. A flashback, kind of like when you're watching a movie and the screen goes fuzzy and you're being taught as a viewer why we got to this point or why we're here. Why is John even in prison? Well, in this case, let's look at this uh, flashback starting at verse 17. Starts with John in prison, verse 17. For Herod himself had given orders himself to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able. She got mad at John because she made, in a way, a lateral move, potentially beneficial for her. And we'll get into the detail in just a minute. But, but to marry her husband, uh, Philip's brother, many problems could have been avoided if they had just heeded this advice. And yet, this is an ungodly family, so they were never really desiring to follow God's will anyway. Pompey conquered Rome from Palestine, and that placed uh, Antipater in charge, and they were an Idumean. That makes a lot of sense how someone like this could be king of the Jews and the whole Herodian family. They didn't even really care about following God's will. Far from it, actually. So we're going to untangle the web. On the back of your outline, I gave you a chart as we look at um, this messed up um, uh, family of relations. Well, let's look at this chart on the screen. It is a mess. I've only listed for you the ones that are found in Scripture. So as I'm speaking, the details that I had to type out in line in proper order so I won't get confused, uh, maybe you can look at those errors and make sense of this. I'm the type of person, and I'm drawing attention to this so you can know how fun this might be. Uh, you might not be a, one to think this way. I think visually as well, uh, even more so. So if you come up to me and introduce someone who's a relative and you say, this is my brother's cousin, sister's aunt's wife or something like that, just know that I've already lost you. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm way lost. Don't they? Just say relative. That sticks in my mind. Family, all right? So it was extra difficult and hard for me, but also fun to figure out this mess. And I look forward to sharing some details that relate as well. Have you ever noticed how many times, though, the name Herod is in the Bible? Herod, how many times it's, it appears? Uh, Herod, uh, the wise man, came to seek advice as to where to find this newborn child, this infant Jesus. And uh, it was the same Herod who ordered the massacre of those children in Beth Bethlehem. And then you see in Mark chapter 6 here, a Herod is found and mentioned again, who's going to be the one beheading John the baptizer. And then Jesus, before the last hours of his life, in the mockery of a trial, uh, appeared before a Herod. And then in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, James, one of the first apostles to die, actually the first, was put to death by a Herod. Or is that all that the same guy? Well, no. One person in the chronology of time couldn't have lived long enough to do all of those things and did not by any means. So they're not the same guy. Let's look in our family tree now of the Herodian dynasty or family and try to make sense out of this uh, gruesome tale. Uh, the family itself makes a gruesome tale that a lot of talk show hosts would love to uh, uh, get this family on their show for ratings. Herod, the first time you read about him, he's talking about Herod the Great. And you're reading the scriptures, the first Herod that comes onto the scene is talking about Herod the Great. Uh, he's the king of Judah, uh, placed in charge by the Romans in 37 B.C. 37 B.C. And, and, of course, died and reigned until his death in 4 B.C. So he was Herod the Great because of his great building projects. Caesarea, if you visit that place and you see the beautiful um, Asia blue of the Mediterranean, there's a big theater there that's looking on that beautiful, gorgeous site. And uh, under Herod's rule, he had that built. Also, if you look at, uh, let's see, the, the water, uh, it was fed from Mount Carmel, 17 miles of aqueducts feeding that place. It was beautiful. Herod built that as well. And you can still see those 2,000 years later. Uh, the Macedon, you've seen some uh, documentaries perhaps of this. And it's a ma fascinating that uh, Herod was a great builder. But, say it all that to say this. History says he's Herod the Great for that reason, but he was not, morally speaking, on the standard of God's word, he was not a morally great man. 
He was not a good person indeed. He was very jealous. He was 73 years old when the wise men came and looked for that new birth of the king. The, the, king of, the birth of the king, he was going to come. And that made this 70-year-old Herod, 73-year-old Herod, very jealous, very, accom- uh, very accustomed to defending his throne and holding on to what he thought was his forever. Well, that was the one who executed or sent out the execution for all of those um, children ages two and under such an evil alone is enough to identify a person and sad to say maybe for life but but his personal life was even worse as we look at the fact that for example he had 10 wives and let's start with that he had 10 wives he became insanely jealous of his wives and his children fearing that they would take over his throne so much so that he killed many of them let that sink in for a minute the Jews would have a saying, oh, it's safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son. And that's true. He wouldn't touch a pig, but he sure would kill a son. And he did. He had ten wives, and I want to talk about just a few of them because every detail leads into the story. It's a web of relationships, as we have outlined here in Mark chapter 6. Secular records help us a lot. He had a wife named Doris. She bore him a son named Antipater. Herod killed him. Another one of his wives, Meramne the first, sometimes spelt with an N, but that's neither here nor there. Meramne was her, an Herodian. She bore him two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. Herod killed both of those. So Aristobulus, uh, as time went on, though, before his death, bore a child, a daughter, named Herodias. And you know that name quite well. We're going to come back to her in just a moment. Herod later married another Meramne II. I guess he just liked that name. Uh, I'm not really sure. And she bore him a son named Herod Philip. Now, you may think that's a typo on the left and right-hand columns of the screen. That's not a typo. This is, this is two different people. And it's kind of like saying, this is my brother Daryl, this is my other brother Daryl. You know, well, not very original here. I, I remember that show as a child, right? I remember that show. Well, uh, he wasn't killed. This particular Herod Philip in Mark 6 was not killed particularly, but he became a uh, very wealthy in the private sector we'll call it we'll just say that and he uh, was able to live a long life because he was no threat to the king his dad okay Herod Philip notice what he did Herod Philip came to visit Rome and he married Herodias now you see what happened in case I, I went too quick let's spit it, spell it out he married his niece by his half-brother Aristobulus who had been executed now the plot thickens. It doesn't stop there. Herod had another wife named Malthus who had two sons. Their names were Archelaus and Herod Antipas. And I listed him for you because he is central to our story. Herod Antipas, he was the one on the throne during the time of Christ. Herod Antipas, though, succeeded Herod the Great, uh, king of Judea, and he was the one who questioned Jesus before his execution. He was the one. And he was the one on the throne while John the baptizer is in prison. But you'll notice something here in our text, Mark chapter 6. He visited Rome to see his brother, Philip, and while there, he seduced Philip's wife, Herodias. And she left Philip and married Herod Antipas. Now you talk about a tangled web. This woman is his niece by a half brother who's also now the sister-in-law and she becomes his wife i told you i had to spell all this out it got confusing but now just let that sink in for a minute and just look at those two arrows and it kind of makes a little sense go home and study this on your by yourself and you'll see all the details but i left out one detail until now while herodias is married to philip she births a daughter named salome now, she's not mentioned in Mark 6 by name, but she is the daughter who danced centrally before the presence of Herod. And just think of who Herod is to this woman, Salome. Whew. It's incredible. So now I want you to take your Bibles back to Mark chapter 6 and follow on the outline. Why is John in prison? Because he had the gall to say, it's not lawful for you to have her. Well, I grew up only hearing one reason why it's not. There are a lot of reasons why it's not lawful for him to have this woman as his wife. Look at verse 17. He did this because, putting John in prison, because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And now in verse 19, Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. Fascinating enough to Herod Antipas, 
John was the type of person that, that he was intrigued by John. He, John was a person who obviously didn't want any following himself, so in that sense he didn't fear him as a threat to the throne, but he had power politically because he was popular with the, with the people. And so he, he wanted to hear him, not necessarily wanting to follow God's way, but, but he was fascinated by John. He didn't want to kill him. Look at verse 20. Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous or holy man. I just say the word genuine so that we can kind of understand that a little bit better. Why would he not kill John and not care about following Christ? Well, John, John was a genuine man. When Herod, was, uh, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled and yet liked to hear him. So that's the paradox. John's appearance, just by the appearance alone, he probably would have been the most unusual man to, to come onto the human landscape. But his message, he was an intimidating uh, character. He respected John. But because Herod knew he spoke the truth, he didn't want to kill him, not necessarily this way. But notice how Herod is caught in the middle of tension. He's in a dilemma here. He feared John, but he also feared his wife. So what do you do? She probably henpecked him unmercifully. Well, at this moment, Herod the Great, or Herod, or I should, no, not Herod the Great. This king, Herod, Antipas, stays in the middle. And look at verse 21. He doesn't allow John to be executed until here. Finally, the opportune time came. Opportune, what does that in, uh, signify? That there was a pre-desire there. There was a premeditated desire to follow through and look for an opportunity to do what? There was a plan to carry out on the part of Herodias. And this was an opportunity, and she probably thought very quickly. And in some, in some cases, they probably had some help on on his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias, look at that chart again, the daughter of Herodias, Salome, came in and danced. She pleased Herod and his dinner guests. I would say so. Herod, of course, feeling kind of uh, um, possessive wanting people to remember who he was during that time as she was no doubt pleasing everyone, maybe visually stimulant. And then they say, I, I can give you anything they want. They probably wanted to give her a lot as well, but then Herod says, I'll give you anything up to half the kingdom. You remember the story? Don't you think that Herodias is quite good at manipulating the desires of her now husband somehow? There is the commander, and I want to read this to you, um, F.B. Myers He's really good with words, and he wrote something about this particular event that will capture your emotion. And as he paints word pictures, I want to try my best to read this. It's very well written. When the great banquet chamber was specially illuminated, the tables decked with flowers and gold and silver plates, laughter and myrrh echoed through the vaulted roof from the company that lie on the sumptuous couches strewing the floor from end to end to the other end of the spacious hall. It was the most perilous thing Herod could do to have this banquet. Lying back on his divan, uh, uh, divan, uh, divan and lolling on his cushions, eating his rich food, coughing on the sparkling wine, exchange rapport with his followers. It was, now listen to this, it was as if the petals of his soul were all open to receive the first insidious spore of evil that might float by in the sultry air. Love the imagery there. Because it just seems like everything's going great. There's nothing that could happen. You've been in situations where elements are this case, where everything seems great. Everything seems lush and lavish, but then lewd and lascivious instantly. And any temptation that comes along is sure to be latched onto. Well, in the middle of this, something unusual happens, far from the imagination of Herod in, 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 by any respects. Not the fact that Salome danced, but the result of that or the cause for it. Salome, the daughter of Herodias, gets up to dance. Well, what's the big deal? People dance at parties, right? Solo dance, which was even at this time associated with a disgusting lewd pantomime that prostitutes would be known for. Salome, a princess of royal birth, to get up and perform that kind of a dance in the presence of the king. This august company as well shows you the kind of character that they were and also the further indication of how Herodias was filled with hate to let this go on as she despised John. This is an evil woman. Evil does exist in the world by those who choose to embrace the lack of good. And what happens next? What happens next? Herod's a weak man. He's weak morally. 
If he had never taken Herodias as his wife, it would have shown some character, but he was weak in that respect, and, and that's the case. Herodias also made him a weaker man by handpecking him to death and constant uh, bugging, but she was also Jezebel-like in her mind to craft such a thing. Weakened by the consumption of alcohol, sure, that was an element as well, no doubt, can't ignore that. And now he was weakened by the lust and jealousy to show that this was his. Uh, verse 24, let's go to the scriptures. Verse 24, he just kind of shouts out there, I'll give you anything you want, anything up to half the kingdom. In the context, I've just tried to imagine the laughter, the roar that took place by everyone in that room. Verse 24, we see a plot, and we see it's a plot because she didn't say, well, here's what I want, or let me think about it. She goes straight to her mother and asks, here's how it went down. Here's what he said. What should I do? Verse 25, at once the girl hurried in the king or, or in, into the presence of the king with this request. And that request is as follows. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now there's a lesson right here. There's nothing that compares to sensual temptation as far as eroding judgment. And I think that uh, we've maybe sensed that personally in our lives so that we can relate to stories like this. The Bible talks about fleeing uh, temptation in a number of contexts. But in 1 Corinthians 6.18, please remember, this goes to anyone. 1 Corinthians 6.18 gives a special warning to flee sexual immorality or to flee fornication. That's one of the reasons that God, I think, well, God has made us in such a way so that God's parameters are great when followed. But if you flirt with that Achilles heel, you will fall. And people who think it's a cute thing to, to flirt with uh, that type of rapport or the sensual realm with the person of the opposite gender and becoming that way, it, it, uh, they think, oh, this is okay. I've got this. No problem. God knows better. And you're fooling yourself. You'll fail every time. That's exactly why Joseph fled physically as, um, let's see, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. But, of course, in that process of that grab, he just kept on running, leaving his cloak in her hand. She did not get what she wanted in that respect. And so it's very important to follow our examples in Scripture in a positive way. So do you see what Herod did, though? He was overcome by lust and sensual nature. And he says, I'll just give anything, anything up to half the kingdom. And then in verse 26, the king was greatly distressed when he heard this, of all things, this come back as her request. But notice what it says. Because of his oaths, really? Because of his oaths? This is not exactly a man of character and honor and didn't exactly break his word in days past. So, but it was the oaths, listen, in the presence of his dinner guests, and he did not want to refuse her. This is the military commanders. These are the people who are the top dogs. And what would they think about him if he heard this request and then chose to break it? He would be a man of no respect, and it greatly grieved him. I find it interesting to mention this as well when we talk about friends and our company that we keep. Now, Herod Antipas wasn't exactly a godly man, didn't care about doing what's right anyway, but if your friends, or no, so I say if your associations encourage you to do things that are ungodly or to go against God's will, if their opinion and approval of you is more important than God's, then those friends matter too much. Get rid of them. Teach them first. See if they want to join the direction you're going. But that's not a friend. So, long story short, verse 27. So he immediately sent an executioner with the orders to bring John's head. And the man went, beheaded and John in the prison. It's kind of interesting that people who live quiet lives end up passing away sometimes in ways that make the newspapers. And then it's also interesting that people who just draw the crowds pass away silently and in obscurity. And we wonder, whatever happened to so-and-so? Oh, he passed away several years ago. Well, here's the case where John the baptizer, he was... Popular with the crowds, hundreds, thousands of people coming to hear him. A big movement that was God divine as well, God sanctioned. But then here he is just at the age of 34, 35, passing away. The door knocked, he opened, and there was a big blade there that was made reference to, no doubt. Come walk with me, five steps later, and John is gone. It's incredible. You talk about a gruesome party, though. It was presented to the girl. We don't know if it was presented in the presence of all of the guests, but... It was presented to the girl, and I just wonder what kind of smirk on Herodias' face was experienced at that moment. If you could have been there. Mm. God is a patient, just God, and I know that no unrighteousness uncovered by the blood of Christ will go unpunished. But, but, it goes on to say, on hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So, you say, well, is that the end of John the baptizer? Not necessarily. 
The verse read earlier might have been a little confusing if you had not known the story, as you probably do. But no, it wasn't John the baptizer that was resurrected. But these great works in Jesus were so revolutionary. Even though John, he did not do a miracle or perform one, the, the word on the street because of everything Jesus was doing was causing great attention. And guess what? Though dead, he speaks. Have you ever heard that? Though dead, he speaks. I wonder if it's not John the Baptist, guilt-stricken Herod was convinced, this is John. This is John. I mentioned earlier that in Mark chapter 6, it's a flashback. Now let's go to the present tense, very briefly. Present tense in Mark chapter 6, verse 14. Jesus is at work, and King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the, uh, the Baptist has been risen from the dead. And this is why the miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, no, he's Elijah. And others claimed he's one of the prophets or like the one of the prophets long ago. But now look at verse 16. When Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. I almost get goosebumps. And this past week, I just reading that out loud, I got goosebumps thinking about how oh, guilt is haunting him unmercifully. I don't want any one of you to have that type of guilt. And guess what? From this point forward, right choice is made. You won't. But Herod was probably very upset with his uh, wicked wife at this point. Guilt has an interesting way of plaguing us. And here's a quotable quote. Sometimes when death occurs before guilt can be repented of, it lingers a long time. John the baptizer was quite a man, though. 2,000 years later, we're looking at his influence, and he has taught us a lot today. We've looked at several lessons, and this concludes this little series. He was an evangelist. We need to become an evangelist today, too. We're going to be inspired. We're going to be equipped to do what God wants us to do. Don't worry. You can do this. John's influence still lives in us, and we can learn a great deal from him. May we also be so resolved to live for God that we will die for truth if we need to. We will die for it. You know, someone says that Christianity is worth dying for. It's worth living for Go figure, I want you to put on Christ in baptism. I want you to live the Christian life, not because you might die tonight or Christ might return tomorrow before this sermon is over. You never know, but because you're going to live with him. What greater life is there? Truth defined his mission. And you know what? Truth should define my mission too. Regardless of opposition, I want to live for truth and enjoy that blessing. And to appeal to your intellect, not just emotion, but your intellect, don't you want that too? John the baptizer was a person of conviction who lived the way God wanted him to live, who did what God wanted him to do, who pointed people to Jesus and was willing to die for them. And that's exactly what we do also. May we live for truth so as that even we will die for it if need be. Who do you live for? Who do you live for? Jesus Christ died for you. I should live for him. His death took away my sin by the shedding of his blood, so that now I may have life. And by the resurrection, after he was buried in that tomb, on the third day rose again, that means I have immortality because he has the power over death. And how can I acquire those blessings? By reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection, putting him on in baptism, as Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says. The standard of God's word lets us know how we can contact the grace by the work of God doing this in us as we yield to his will. So who do we live for? Since your life is guided by beliefs, it's really another question of who do you trust? And I'm going to do something a little different. The next click actually shows you the invitation song, Trust and Obey. Who do you trust? Who do you obey? Who are you going to live for? We can ask it this way. Do you trust God enough to do what he says he'll do if you follow his will? Put him on in baptism this morning if you need to as we stand and as we sing.